for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday morning, November the 30th, 1991. Thanksgiving weekend teaching and deliverance camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Linda Sutter is the speaker of the morning. Come and minister this morning. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 7 this morning. How many of you that are here this morning, I know we've asked for hands before, but I'm curious, how many of you, this is the first time you've been to Lake Hamilton? Quite a number of you yet. We've had a few people that have had to leave, and others of you have come. We're glad to have you, welcome you. I'll tell you, the first time you come to Lake Hamilton, if you haven't been around a deliverance ministry, it's an education. It's a, it's a good thing to come to. And some people, when I see them walk in the door the first time and sit in the services, maybe hear a little bit of conversation out in the cafeteria, I kind of smile to myself because it reminds me of me the first time I came to camp. The first time I came in, Irma will tell you that I walked out on her meetings. And uh, I'd sit in the afternoon deliverance services here, and I'd sit as long as I could, and I'd get up and walk out. Uh, walk out, yeah, get up, get up and leave. <laughs> and uh, for whatever reason, I just didn't feel comfortable. But it wasn't demons that was doing that, it was because I knew more than everybody else, and I didn't think I had any demons. Well, then finally I was able to submit to the fact that maybe I did have a problem or two, a demon or two, but um, it would be taken care of, you know, uh, in, in good order and in time, and so I'd, I'd sit in the services and and I'd, you know, I'd think that, well, things will be taken care of in time. And this pattern went on for quite a while. You know, the Lord is very gracious to us. He's very good to us. He, and I look at other people, you know, going through the same thing, and now I just kind of sit back and smile. Because I hear some of the exact same words that I used to say. And I'll see somebody who is normally very passive or very quiet say, uh, no, I don't have any spirits in me. Uh, no, God has protected me. Uh, I've, you know, I'm, I'm just, everything is fine. And I just smile and I say, well, you know, if the Lord has his hook in them, they're going to be back here or God's going to leave them some other place where they're going to get help for their so-called problem. Amen. And I'm thankful this morning that God brought help for my problems. And, you know, when you're in the ministry, you especially don't like to confess that you might have a problem. You don't want to confess that you have a need. And sometimes I think this is a problem among Christians in general because we've had so much teaching about having a positive confession and having a positive attitude that we are not willing to admit that we've got problems. We've prayed about things and we say, well, they're all taken care of. And woe be it if we talk about them. I remember being in a prayer group for ten years. And I'll tell you, that prayer group had the biggest religious spirit over it that I've ever seen. Everybody would come on Sunday with this pietistic look on their face. And you didn't let anybody know uh, about anything that happened during the week at home. So consequently, nobody ever got any help. We lived in this fantasy world that uh, everything was okay and we were going on to glory and we were going to be manifested and this sort of thing. Meanwhile, everybody is hurting. Everybody is feeling rejected. It was interesting. I don't uh, mention this very often, but in this particular prayer group, uh, everybody in the group was had been a Christian for a long time. I was probably the newest Christian 
And I was filled with the Spirit in 1963, so you know uh, what the age was of the group in general. And every week, as they'd come together, nobody would... In- it finally got to the place, nobody inquired about one another. If somebody wasn't there for some reason, nobody inquired about the person. And everybody felt rejected. Everybody felt that nobody else cared about them. Well, the problem was nobody ever opened up to one another. Nobody was ever given the privilege of praying with one another. So consequently, all these problems kept going on and people felt neglected. Interesting, isn't it? Now, the thing I'm going to talk about this morning as we get into this is about the spirit of rejection. And I like to say that I believe I get a little more deliverance every time I minister this. Everybody has felt rejected at one time or another in some way or another. Amen? Raise your hand if you've ever been rejected. Uh, If you haven't been rejected, uh, uh, you can leave this morning. But I think every one of us have been uh, to some extent. Now... When I first started coming to camp and I didn't think I had any problems, when I finally did owe up to the fact that I might have a demon or two, uh, I figured as long as I get finally get free from that, I'm really going to be in good shape. And, you know, I got free from one, began to get free from another, and lo and behold, I found out there were some other problems lurking that I had not been aware of. Because these uh, one or two or three or four or five, some of the rest of you know how many there were, better than I do. Uh, When I got rid of some of those, I I had been so consumed by those, I didn't know that there might be some high-mindedness back here, some pride or whatever, because all of these other things had been in the forefront. Well, you know, in the Scripture, in Deuteronomy 7, when God is uh, talking to his people through his servant, He's telling the people how they are going to be when they go into the promised land, what they're supposed to do, what they're not supposed to do. And first of all, he says in Deuteronomy 7, he says, You are a people holy to the Lord your God. And I want you to take this particular part of the verse and apply it to yourself this morning. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people to be his treasured possession. How many of you know this morning that you are God's treasured possession? You're his peculiar people. You're his chosen one. And it says, now we're going to read on, it says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and chose you because you were more numerous than other people. All right. For you were the fewest of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you. You know, there is a scripture in Ezekiel chapter 16. It says, when nobody else desired you, speaking of Jerusalem, when nobody else wanted you, I wanted you. When other people passed by and they saw you there dying, they just went on by. But I saw you laying there, uh, rejected from your mother's womb. I saw you there laying in your own blood. And I said to you, live. Oh, hallelujah. That's how God looks at us. When nobody else wanted you, he saw something good in you. He saw a little flicker in your life that wanted righteousness. Praise the Lord. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath, he swore to your forefathers and he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, we know that Egypt is a type of the world. And when we're in bondage to the world, we're in slavery. And all of us, in one way or another, at one time in our life, were slaves to the world. We were slaves to the world system. And uh, God, by his mighty hand, brought us out cleaned us up, is in the process still, amen, of cleaning us up. Not one of us, not one of us is not in need of deliverance. Every Christian needs deliverance. Every single Christian needs deliverance. 
I say that uh, without reservation, Glenn. Uh, isn't that right? Every single one of us needs deliverance. We could have been walking with Jesus 50 years or longer. There's times we still need deliverance. We still need ministry. We still need to be prayed for. We haven't conquered everything. And when the, uh, as it goes on in the book of uh, Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy 7, uh, the Lord says, the Lord your God, verse 22, will drive out those nations before you. Now, the nations uh, that he was going to drive out are symbolic of the evil spirits that torment us. All of those ites, all those Hittites and Canaanites, Par- Parasites, whatever, all of them are representative of demonic spirits. And God will drive them out of our land. He'll drive them out of our life. And it says, though, that you will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once. Now, it's interesting, and this is the truth. I hate to, I hate to tell you this, but I came to camp, and when I finally owed up to the fact that I had a demon or two, I came in and I sat down at the, in the deliverance service and decided, well, I will submit to this. And I sat about right over here, maybe the first row, second row, and I thought, I'll go along with this. And I'll breathe and I'll do all of these things and get rid of these things. I finally acknowledged very quietly to myself, yes, I might have a problem. But nothing manifested. Everybody around me was seemingly getting all kinds of deliverance. And I just sat there. And so then I decided again. And I remember saying to somebody, well, really, I don't think I have any demons. I think I told Glenn that one time. I really don't believe I have any demons. You know, nothing happens. Well, then, uh, time goes on and a few things happen. Uh, I decided then that, well, I can get it all at one time. Now, that's the way we want to, uh, we would like it to happen. We'd like to get deliverance all at once. Let's get this thing over with and get on with living life and doing what God has called us to do. Get rid of it all at one time. But you see, the Lord said to Israel, he wouldn't drive those demons out all at once. It said that he would drive them out little by little. Now, that word, little by little, it's not exactly the same as it is in our English language. That little by little, if you look that up and see what the Hebrew meant, it talked about uh, how God would, by a miraculous act, he says, one miraculous act after another miraculous act, I'm going to drive those... uh, uh, enemies out of your land. In a, in, in, the idea is of a supernatural work on the part of God. One supernatural work after another, he's going to drive them out. He doesn't do it all at once. He says, or the wild animals will multiply around you. Uh, uh, they, you get cleansed, totally cleansed, uh, unless you're immediately filled up with something else. Uh, you Seven more will come in, it says in the New Testament. Worse than the others were. So God drives out those enemies little by little. Now, it's interesting, when we first come to the Lord, He protects us. When Israel first came out of Egypt, God really protected them. I mean, He covered them over with His wings, so to speak. Uh, He really watched out for them. It says over in Exodus 13, verse 17, when he brought them out. Now, we know that he led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when the cloud moved, they moved. We've been singing about the the glory cloud. Uh, When the cloud moved, they moved. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. And God saw that there was a lot of needs in the people's lives And it says of him, God said, that he would not take them through the land of the Philistines. Now, we know that if Israel had one chronic enemy, who was it? It was the Philistines. They could get every other enemy conquered, and there would still be the Philistines lurking there. Well, it's interesting what the word Philistine means. It means to roll in the dust. But you know, it has another meaning, too. You look in Strong's Concordance, and it will tell you it also means to wallow in self. (coughs) That kind of puts things in a different light, doesn't it? To wallow in self. And I'll tell you what, 
we can get free of every demon that works around us, you're still going to have self to deal with. You're still going to have to continually reckon with self. You're going to continually have to bring that down uh, and let that be crucified. Allow it to be put to death. Amen? You wonder sometimes why people who are mature in the Lord and uh, seem to just be walking in all kinds of authority and all kinds of victory and yet sometimes the most ugly thing will manifest in them and it'll kind of throw you sometimes. We've all got to deal with that enemy of self uh, through our entire lives. Now, at the beginning, when we're first saved, uh, we don't see that enemy so much. God just makes things easy for us. We just go from glory to glory. We just go from cloud to cloud. We just live off up here in a realm that we never knew existed before. God, when he brought them out of Egypt, I'll tell you, they, they were going with the Spirit of God, the protection of the Lord. The adrenaline, I'm sure, was really pumping in their system at the time. Uh, nothing could touch them. But God said, I'm not going to take them through that land of the Philistines. Lest they lose heart and go back to Egypt. And so God protects us early in our Christian life. Uh, when we are just getting started. Protects us. But eventually, we have to deal with that Philistine. And I'll tell you, who was it that lived among the Philistines? They had their giants, didn't they? There was a, uh, one big one in particular that we know about whose name was Goliath. And I think it's interesting that David, in the scripture, who is a type of Jesus Christ, uh, went out and slew that giant. And I'll tell you, it is only the Lord that can crucify the flesh. We can reckon it dead, but God has to really do the crucifying. We can't do it. It's an impossibility for you to crucify yourself. You can get a nail in one hand and in two feet, but you, someone else is going to have to put the nail in the other hand. You can't do it. God has to do it. And David went out and, and slew that giant so that they could uh, get on and, uh, and get on with the things that God had called them to do. Well, as we begin to mature, God begins to let us see some of the problems, some of the things that have stood in the way of our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with other people. Now, I didn't want to owe up to the, fa owe up to the fact that I had demons. But I'll tell you, things that happened to me in my relationships with other people, things that I encountered in the ministry, all proved to me that there was a problem of some kind that needed to be dealt with. If you can't be convinced in one way, circumstances ought to be able to convince you that you've got some problems. When you see people treating you the same way over and over and over again, you're going through the same problem over and over and over again. It's not always the other people that are the wrong ones. Sometimes it's yourself. In fact, most of the time, it's ourselves. And it's time then that we have to stop and say, Okay, Lord, what's going on here? This person has rejected me. This one's rejected me. That one's rejected me. This one's turned against me and slandered me. This one's done this. Uh, and, you know, we go around and we talk to people and we say, Oh, you know, I don't know why this happens over and over again. People come crying to me sometimes, you know, and, and I hear the same. Their history is the same wherever ever they've been or wherever they have lived. The name of the problem is D-E-M-O-N. And the answer is deliverance. And we won't spell that one out, but you know how it's spelled. Now, there is something that I have not had time yet to really research out like I should. And I'm going to just make reference to it this morning. But we're talking specifically about rejection. Now, in the book, and probably in other books besides, but I'm acquainted with Pigs in the Parlor, uh, and the Moody's, or the Hammonds talk about, uh, rejection. The Moody's do too in, in their teachings that are in the manual back there. But when you are rejected, what is one of the first things that happens after you've gotten hurt? You begin to get resentful. And you begin to put walls up. And as that resentment grows, then what happens? We begin to get rebellious. Now, it is interesting, I was studying the word rebellion in the scripture. 
and particularly in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel talks about the rebellious house of Israel, there is one word that is used there that is not used in some of the other places where the word rebellion is used. It's another word that has, it has a strong relationship to bitterness. And when Samuel talked to Saul in uh, 1 Samuel 15:23, and we quote this scripture often here, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It is the same word there for rebellion as is used in the book of Ezekiel that has that strong relationship to bitterness. And as I thought about that, I got to thinking about people that I know, and I have met many people through the years who have been uh, practitioners in the occult, have been active in the occult. My path has crossed with people like that many times. And I think it is interesting that of all the people that I have met that have been active in the occult, every single one has had a bitter and unforgiving spirit, without exception. And uh, Brother uh, Parrish yesterday, when he was talking about Simon the Sorcerer and how uh, he had uh, lifted himself up as someone great when Peter came down and Peter discerned the problem that was in Simon, what did he say? I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness. Now, many times, people that have been hurt and have gotten resentful and then rebellious have moved into the occult, it's because they want to have power over other people. I mean, you were hurt by so, uh, so somebody did this, so I'm going to have some way get power, uh, so I will have power over them. And if that isn't taken care of when you become a Christian, that same attitude will begin to predominate in your Christian life and it won't be uh, maybe a cult power in the, in the strict sense of the word, although it is a cult power, but it'll be a kind of a religious occult power, religious witchcraft. We talk about charismatic witchcraft, religious witchcraft, where people want to control other people, even by gifts of the Spirit. You know, I live up in Wisconsin, and there is um, an individual I know up there who prides himself on their prophetic gift. Actually, this woman got kicked out of every church that she ever went to. Finally, there was no more churches for her to go to, so she started her own church. And believe it or not, there's people that go to that church besides her own family. But the problem was she always wanted her own way. So what would she do? She would prophesy to people. I mean, it got so bad, I didn't know that people could get taken by something like this. But she, they were going to go to a conference or something, and it would be all established who was going to ride with who. And this woman, who I thought was a mature Christian, would prophesy who would ride in what car. And people got all shook up over that. And they didn't want to go against the word of the Lord. And I thought, surely everybody can see that this woman is a loony. But people get taken in by that because there are these uh, gifts operating in her. I'll tell you what, if we don't get rid of witchcraft, for example, in our life, uh, if you don't let the Lord deal with that and root that out of you, uh, you can speak in tongues and, and uh, have gifts of the Spirit operating in your life, but they will begin to turn and will begin to be polluted and perverted, and it will not be a true gift of God. Rejection breeds resentment, resentment breeds rebellion, and rebellion and bitterness go hand in hand. Now, I'm I'm going to make an admission this morning. I believe in my life I have been rebellious. I believe that God has set me free from a lot of rebellion. There's no doubt more that he wants to set me free from. But when you suffer a lot of rejection, you begin to just draw into yourself We see the steps that take place. Now, there's many ways that people get rejected. But I'm going to mention the most common this morning. And I would say that within our group that we have here today, that many of you in here will identify with each of the ones that I'm going to mention. And I believe the very first way that we get rejected, you can be rejected by one of your parents or both of your parents. Or you can be rejected even before you're born. 
rejected in the womb. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little more in a, in a minute or two, but we really have to be honest with one another. We cannot expect to get the help we need if we're not honest with ourselves, with God, and with one another. I was at a meeting about three weeks ago, a conference, and this uh, lady a uh, minister that was conducting the conference got up and she was talking about the fact that she had three children and she got pregnant again and all she could think about was how much money this fourth child was going to cost her. She wasn't saved, but she tried to get an abortion and she couldn't. Whatever happened, I don't know the details and she didn't mention the details, but she was not able to get an abortion. And she said, she says, I didn't know about that beautiful little girl that I was going to have. She says, all I could think of was how much money this was going to cost and we could hardly live as it was with three uh, young children. So one day she was ministering to this daughter that she gave birth to. And she said, you know, if you don't uh, deal with problems uh, demonic problems as they come along. Eventually, uh, that, that thing is going to surface and is going to rail against you. And she's in trying to cast a spirit of, you know what it is, rejection out of her daughter. And the demon spoke right out of her daughter's mouth and says, well, you didn't want her anyway. You tried to abort her. Now, I don't know that the daughter even knew that. But that mother had to stop right then and deal with that situation in her own life before she could go on and see her daughter get delivered. And she said, if I had been successful in having that... Now, she said this in a conference with a couple of hundred people. She said, if I had been successful in getting that abortion, she said, I wouldn't have this young lady preacher sitting right next to me today. Her daughter was sitting right there and was ministering in the services. Powerful a uh, young lady, powerful in the Word. I thought that was interesting. We really have to be honest. And some of you have been rejected by parents. Some of you maybe were unwanted. Maybe there was already eight children in the family. Maybe there was only one or two, or maybe your parents didn't want any children. But you felt that from earliest childhood. You know, God will set you free of that this morning. Now, the one that we face a great deal today is people that have been rejected by a wife or by a husband. And we know that this is a spirit that is in the land, the spirit of divorce. And I believe that it is due in part to sins uh, of the previous generations. But nevertheless, you know, you've gone through divorce. You've been rejected by a spouse. And some people, when they're rejected, uh, they'll try to go on. And that thing, unless that gets dealt with, if you try to get into another relationship, it will hinder the next relationship unless it is dealt with. And I'm not talking about whether you should go into other relationships or not. That's not the issue this morning. But unless it is dealt with, it's going to affect you in your relationship with others. It will affect you in your relationships with your children. The people that you work with, it has to be dealt with. Brother Ludicke, the other night when he was talking, he was talking, he mentioned three points about the accusations of the brethren against us and false accusations, and he talked about the adversity of rejection. We get rejected by spouses or by your parents or by relatives, but I'll tell you, I think Probably one of the most painful rejections that a person can face is a rejection by your own children. Someone you've given birth to, you mothers, who you nurtured up and you fathers provided for, tried to raise up to be, and maybe you didn't do the best job in the world, but nobody has ever been a parent before they're a parent. But you get rejected by a child, and I, when I, and I've never had children, but I'll tell you, I feel the pain that you feel when people begin to talk about how they've been rejected by a parent, by a, by a child. I really feel that. And there may be reasons for it. Maybe you did something that caused that child to reject you. But nevertheless, the hurt is still there. 
And then there is a rejection that comes by, by other ministries, by associates that you have. I think the ones in our own family are probably uh, among the most painful to deal with. But then there's that rejection of other people and other Christians. I'll tell you, the first time I got rejected by other Christians, I thought I was the only one who had ever gone through that. And you know, I am in a place in life, the job that I do is open for rejection to come against it. There are people everywhere I go that don't believe that a woman should stand by behind a pulpit. And for the most part, I've learned to just let it roll off. I figure for each one that rejects you, there's two that are open to you. And I don't want to get into the theology of that this morning, but I know what it is like to be rejected by people that are your peers. And no doubt any of us that want to go on with God are going to be rejected by fellow Christians, by people that you've sat with in church, have worked with in the ministry. It's going to happen. Jesus, in John chapter 16, was speaking to his disciples. He says, you know, the time is actually going to come when people will put you to death and think that they have done God a service. You are going to face religious rejection. And that kind of thing is a religious spirit that really doesn't know God anyway. It's going to happen. You know, whenever truth comes to us, it separates. I wish it didn't. There's people that, you know, I have loved tremendously that don't want anything to do with me anymore. It's the same with all. I mean, I'm no exception. It's happened to you. I'm not asking for any sympathy. Don't say, oh, to me. I mean, it's going to happen to you too. (laughs) Truth brings separation. There's a desire in your heart. You want to go on with God. And you go and begin to share it with some of the people in the church you sit in. They're not hearing that. They think you're going off the deep end. You're going to get, uh, there's going to come a separation of some kind eventually. And I'm not saying, oh, you've got to leave your churches. I believe very emphatically that we are to be in local churches. That we're to be accountable. That we are to be in fellowship with one another. We don't go off and live off here in the wilderness somewhere. That's another spirit that tells you to do that. But you will get rejected by your brethren. And we think that we're the only ones that have been rejected. What does the scripture say about Jesus? It says, he was despised and rejected of men. I mean, can you imagine the ultimate rejection to be upon the cross? And they've all left you. All of those people that you invested your time and your energy in for the last three and a half years, they're all gone. John is standing over there. The mother of Jesus is standing Uh, nearby, but everybody has rejected him, and just uh, days before, they had lined the streets, waving palm branches, and declaring him, uh, calling, saying, Hosanna. Things can change very quickly. You might have a great name one day, one week later, your name is Mud. So you've been, perhaps, rejected by a parent or by a spouse by other relatives. You know, it's interesting. The spirit of rejection robs you. It absolutely robs you of relationships that you could have. You know, because I felt rejection that came against me as an early child, I had this mistaken idea that my whole family, all of my relatives were against me. And it wasn't true. And for years, I missed out on wonderful good fellowship with people that really loved me that I didn't think loved me. And here I am now, well into my 40s, and just now having communication and fellowship restored with some of my relatives because for years I believed a lie. Didn't go to family reunions because, well, nobody likes me there anyway. Now, nobody ever said that. Now, it's true that there might have been one or two that poked fun or said something, But that wasn't the whole gang. And I was deprived and robbed of fellowship for years and years that I could have have had. And perhaps the same thing has happened to you. You believe the lie of the enemy. You've gone around cloaked in all of this rejection. And it's kept you from having the right kind of relationship with the people that are closest to you and love you the most. 
Well then, how can you be free? We're going to pray this morning. We're going to allow plenty of time this morning for ministry and to pray in this area. You know, I, I sense that you're with me. I, I really feel a, a pulling this morning. Uh, and, and, a, and in your spirit, I can tell some of you are really crying out. How can you be free? Well, first of all, we have got to be honest. I already mentioned that one. You've got to be honest with yourself, and you've got to be honest with one another, but most of all, you've got to be honest with God. I make a, a big deal about this every time I minister, because you are not going to get the deliverance that you need or you want if you cannot admit that you've sinned. If you can't admit that you have caused your own problems. Now, I know that many of us have had pressures on our lives. You've had pressures on your life because very possibly, undoubtedly, because of the sins of your parents, things that came against my life. I now know many of the things that came against my life were because of the sins of my forefathers. Every once in a while, I find a little bit more about my family. I got a letter uh, last Christmas from a relative I had never met, still haven't met her, we just corresponded. And I never met her. She lives in the same state I do, down in the southern part of the state. And I thought, well, I'm going to make contact her. I've got her address. So I thought I'd send her my Christmas newsletter and a Christmas card. And in the newsletter, I talk about the meetings last year. and People were saved and healed and delivered and things like this. And I thought, we'll see what happens. She's a Lutheran. <laughs> and I get this letter back from this cousin of mine. And she says, I'm so glad to know that one of the members of our family is in the ministry. She says, your grandmother's and great-grandmother's prayers have been answered. She says, because strong drink has been the enemy in our family. I didn't know that. I had a, a hunch, but I didn't really know that. And then she began to tell me some things in this letter that she has written to me. I was never an alcoholic. I didn't really get into alcoholism. Uh, but there were other things associated with that that were pressures that ha have warred against my life. I guess you don't have to have an addiction to alcohol, but you can have an addiction to other things. Right, Glenn? I'm trying to break free of caffeine right now, and I'm having a horrible time. I was in this conference a few weeks ago, and I'm sitting there all prim and proper, trying to get deliverance here, you know, and some young guy saved off the streets out of cocaine and what have you, comes over and he starts praying against addiction in me. <laughs> I'll tell you, that takes some of the starch out of you. <laughs> Ministerial. So I went home to fast and pray, and I'm going to break this thing. I haven't broken it yet. You all pray for me, okay? It's still working on me. <laughs> but no doubt part of that is due in part to things that are in the family background. So we've got to be honest. I mean, you've got, a, you've got a need, you've got a demon working on you, you've got to talk about it. Get it out in the open. Get it in the light. Satan hates the light. He doesn't like the light. Have you ever noticed how many things go on in the dark? Satan hates light. His deeds are evil and likes to be close with darkness. Get it out here where it can be seen and dealt with. And you know, I'll tell you something. Once it gets out in the light, it loses a lot of its touch. Uh, your perspective changes when it gets out here in the light. I said something to somebody one time, and I mean, I thought this was a horrendous problem. And I got it out in the light, and they laughed at me. And I, you know, I had to laugh, too, eventually. I thought, you know, that is kind of ridiculous, isn't it? But you keep it hidden, and it just gets bigger and bigger in your mind, and you lose all sense of perspective, and you get paranoid, and all of those things that go along with it. So be honest. Be transparent. You know, I was just up in, in Minneapolis, and a friend of mine goes to a very large church up there, but they minister deliverance in this church. It's not the focal part of their ministry, but it's part of the uh, ministry in the church. They have people that minister deliverance. And she said the most interesting thing I've noticed is in the leadership, if they have a problem, somebody comes by and says, how are you doing? They will say, well, you know, I, I'm kind of going through the fire right now. And I thought, that's wonderful. We've had this idea, you got to be on top of everything all the time. That phoniness is right. And then, the next thing you have to do, after being honest, 
I want to, I, I got to say something else about this honesty because we're going to pray here in a little bit. And we are not going to pray, Lord, if I have sinned. We're not going to pray that way. We're going to pray, Lord, I have sinned. Because you put that one little two-letter word in there, if, it puts doubt in your mind. Well, maybe I haven't really sinned. I'll tell you something. You've sinned. I've sinned. You know, when the devil went to tempt Jesus, Jesus had just heard, he had just had this wonderful mountaintop experience, and he heard the voice of God come down out of heaven and say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Immediately after that, Jesus goes out into the wilderness, led by the Spirit. Actually, the word in the Scripture says, driven by the Spirit. He's in the wilderness, and when Satan comes to him, Satan doesn't say, you are the Son of God. He says, if you are the Son of God. That puts doubt. It could put doubt. In Jesus' mind, I mean, Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. But God has spoken something to you, brother, and then Satan will come and say, now, if that's really true, if that's really true. And then you say, well, now, was I thinking right? Was, you know, is this right? Am I off on a wild goose chase here? If. There's no if. Remember how you, what you say to your kids? No if, ands, or buts about it. Did you say that to your children? There are no ifs when it comes to forgiving and forgiveness and sin. You have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, it's not, Lord, if I've sinned, forgive me. Lord, I have sinned. Forgive me. Then after you have been honest with yourself and honestly faced your sin. Now, I'll tell you, it is hard to face some sin. It's hard for you to admit that you've been into pornography. It's hard for you to confess that you've been an adulterer. It's hard for you to confess that you've been a fornicator. It's easier for you to confess, well, I've had a little pride in my life. It's hard to admit that you've beat your wife, that you've sexually abused somebody. I mean, let's get down here where the rubber hits the road. This is where we're living today. But if you have, and here I'm doing it, there has been, there's forgiveness available. I don't know anything about any of you people. I just know that in a group of this size, anything has happened and taken place. All of us come from different kind of backgrounds, represent different kind of cultures. We've been through horrible things. Everybody has. Some families and some individuals more than others. It's hard to admit, but I'll tell you, get it out. That's the first step to your deliverance. The second step to your deliverance is that you've got to forgive those that have sinned against you. And that's a hard one to do. Oh, we can say very glibly, oh, yeah, I forgive them. But you've got to, I mean, really forgive them. Uh, there's a lady I know, and uh, there's been problems in her family through the years in regard to money. And one segment of the family has gotten more than its fair share of the money. Gotten the lion's share. And this has caused some ill feeling in the family. You know, these things do. It's not going to make one bit of a difference a hundred years from now, but it still seems to make a lot of difference right now. All of us could say, you know, you've been perhaps been affected that way. Anyway, periodically, she'll go out for a walk and she'll just go through the whole routine again and forgive them all. She says, I don't want anything to stand in the way of God uh, meeting me and meeting my family. And just in case there's been any little dread that has kept, that is, that is held on, she just goes through that whole thing of forgiveness again. I thought, well, good for her. We can all do that. You know, maybe you've done it once, you can do it again. Maybe you've been done it uh, ten times this year. Uh, so what if you do it twenty times in a month? What if you do it every day? It doesn't make any difference. You are just freeing yourself up that much more for your own freedom and deliverance. And maybe you haven't felt like forgiving. Forgiveness isn't a thing that is determined by your feelings. You hear this preached from the pulpit many times. It is a matter of your will to forgive. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 14, and this is as much a promise as all of the other promises that we claim. 
If you forgive not men their trespasses or their sins, your Father is not going to forgive you either. I mean, that is Scripture. That is the Word. You've been holding animosity in your heart against somebody for years. I'll tell you what, it'll manifest in all kinds of physical ailments, for one thing. You know, there is uh, an incident I know about, a lady that I knew, and she was dying of cancer. And shortly after she was diagnosed with terminal cancer, her husband went out and bought her a new car, brand new car. And at first, she was delighted that she had this brand new car. I mean, what a gesture. You know, he made, buy her this new car, put it in her name, put the insurance on it, and he added to the, the insurance that clause that if the person who, you know, owns a car, the owner of the car who has a loan on it, dies, then the loan is paid in full. All of a sudden, it hit her one day that her husband bought her that car because as soon as she died, he would have the title free and clear. Now, that would be hard to deal with. And she was resentful. She was unforgiving. And I want to tell you something as to how important it is that that you forgive that person. It was within minutes of her death, within minutes, that she was finally able to say to her husband, I forgive you. Minutes before she died, she could forgive him. I thought, you know, that proves something to me how important it is that when we go to the grave, if we go the way of the grave, that we go with no unforgiveness in our hearts. Uh, I don't want to stand before God with unforgiveness in my heart towards anybody. Because he said he's not going to forgive me if I haven't forgiven others. Have you got some unforgiveness in your heart this morning towards somebody? Have you been unforgiving towards the parent that abused you? Have you been unforgiving towards the wife that abused you? Towards the husband that abused you? Mentally, physically abused you? Are you holding animosity towards your brethren that have rejected you? You know, I want to bring something else up here that I have noticed. Sometimes we have gotten treated unfairly by our brethren, by people in the denominations we've been in. And early in my Christian life, I noticed that there were people who had come out of the denominations and were carrying bitterness against the denomination that they came out of. I I saw that early on, and I thought to myself, how can God really bless their ministry when they're unforgiving against their denomination? It doesn't work that way. You can't leave a church and go to another one unless things are clear in the Spirit when you leave the one place and go to the next. Now, maybe they'll never be clear on the part of the other people, but that's not the issue. They've got to be clear on your part. And if that isn't dealt with, then you go out and start an independent church somewhere, for example, and that unforgiveness hasn't been taken care of It will breed rebellion in the house where you now are. And there will be problems, chronic problems, over and over and over again. One man that I knew quite well was ready and willing and tried to take on the whole denomination. God allowed him to go through some things, to take the fight out of him, and just to be submissive to the dealings of the Lord. We started a church uh, some years back, about 10 years ago, now up in northeast Wisconsin. And there were some people that had come to the Lord and were hungry for God. And it had just kind of been a spontaneous moving of the Spirit where people had been born into the kingdom of God. So we were going to start a church. You know, we are all excited about this. Going to have a full gospel church in this town. And we started meeting together and it started off real good. And we had quite a few people coming for a brand new church. And little by little, some of them began to fall away. But there was a core group that really stuck together. But one day I was praying, and I was a pastor of this core group. And one day as I was praying, the words came into my mind about the rebellious house. Now, I hadn't been kicked out of any church. I didn't uh, feel that I was particularly rebellious. Now, in retrospect, I think I had some rebellion. 
But I saw that the people had had a hunger for God, but they were rebellious as well. They were not going to submit in the place where they were. And uh, some of them had never submitted in the place where they were. God absolutely will not bless that sort of thing. I mean, I battled with that for three years, better than three years, and finally absolutely weary and battle-worn. I just laid it down, and another man came in, moved from the West Coast, came in and took over the church, and he was there six weeks, and he left town. He tried to leave in the middle of the night, but we wouldn't let him. There was many things in the community that was warring against it, but the thing that was the, the biggest issue is that there was rebellion in the camp. There was rebellion in the house that really needed to be dealt with. And after he left, I got together with the people and they says, what do we do now? And I says, I believe God wants you to deal with the rebellion that is in your own heart. And if God wants to raise this thing back up again, he will do it. Let it be him that raises it back up. But let's get rid of the rebellion that has been in our midst. And you know, it was interesting to me that they all agreed with me for the first time. Acknowledge that there had been rebellion in the house. Had to deal with the sin. So you need to be honest. We need to be honest this morning. And we need to be forgiving. Now that sounds easy enough. The only thing that will hinder your deliverance and hinder your freedom is if you can't forgive. We can break the curses that have been over your life. We can break the other hindrances. The blood of Jesus is all-powerful. He is greater, greater than any problem you've got. He is greater than the biggest problem uh, that could be manifest, could be talked about. He is bigger. We sang it this morning about uh, the same Spirit that raised up Christ from, you, from the dead will dwell in us, it will quicken our mortal body. Amen? It will quicken us, change us, change us into His image. The only thing, I want to say it again, that will hinder it is your own unbelief, your own unforgiveness. That's it. Nothing else can stand. The devil can't stand in the way. Mark chapter 5, I believe it is, the man who was bound by legion of demons. What could he do? He, even though he was horribly oppressed, chains couldn't hold him. People were afraid of him. Yet in the presence of Jesus, that man could bow his knee and say, Lord, make me clean. He could do it. So no demon is bigger than what has been accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Nothing. Are you ready this morning for God to begin to do a work in you? Hallelujah. You feel we're going to come against the spirit of rejection. We're going to take authority over that. That is the, the big one that plagues God's people. We're going to pray. I want you to bow your heads now. I'm not going to ask who feels that, uh, I'm not going to ask for hands to be raised. I believe all of us need help, need deliverance in this area. I believe I need deliverance this morning. Still in this area. It's little by little. One miraculous deliverance after another that God is setting us free. Hallelujah. Let's pray. And while you're praying, I want you to ask the Lord to show you the people that you may have ought against, that you're holding uh, unforgiveness against. And I also want you to ask the Lord to bring to light the things that are in your life that you have not honestly dealt with. Twenty years after the fact, God began showing me things in my life. It shouldn't have to be that way, but he can do it. Things that are way back. Again, we ask for the searchlight of the Spirit of God right now, Lord, over your people. God, you desire a people that will be clean. You desire a people that will be holy. Uh, your people sitting here this morning, many have been bound, uh, and most have been bound, and have been have suffered in their relationships and in their families, people that they work with, people that they worship with, then had terrible problems with sons and daughters, uh, people all around them. And we pray for the searchlight of your spirit to come in right now in Jesus' name. Begin to speak to us, Lord. And let God deal with you. 
right now is the time to deal with that sin. Anger, rage, lust, unforgiveness, witchcraft. Lord Jesus, we apply your blood to these areas in our lives this morning. We thank you for the cleansing. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that whoever comes to you, you will in no wise cast out. Whoever comes to you, you remove your, our sin as far as the east is from the west. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are doing a work this very moment. Thank you for cleansing. Thank you for cleansing. In Jesus' name. Pray with me. I want you to pray after me. Lord Jesus, I have sinned. I have failed. I have come far short in my walk with you. And I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me. I confess to you my sins of rage, anger, resentment, unbelief, uncleanness, adultery, fornication, witchcraft, emulations, strife. In Jesus' name, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I take authority over uh, the thoughts in my mind that have plagued me, that have hindered me, that I have dwelt on, and I ask you to forgive me of even harboring them. Amen. And now I ask you, Lord, to forgive those who have sinned against me. And you begin to name them in your mind right now. Those that have sinned against you. Mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, children, co-workers, pastors, brethren, boyfriends, girlfriends. The Lord showing me right now somebody here who... I uh, was in a broken engagement. Somebody really misled you. You weren't married, but you, somebody really broke your heart in an engagement. And that has been a, uh, a heaviness on you. You forgive that individual right now. Those that have lied against, uh, about you, told lies against you, forgive right now. Give all of these people to you. Say it after me. Lord, I give all of these people. I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. Hold not their sins against them. They know not what they do. In Jesus' name. Really allow your spirit to be open before the Lord. And we're going to begin to call out these spirits. Brother Glenn, I want your help. <coughs> We're coming against rejection, first of all. Lord, I take authority over the demon of rejection that has plagued your people. The rejection that has come against them from other individuals. We take authority over that demon that has lied to them in Jesus' name. And we call it out right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Demon of rejection, loose your hold on God's people who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Loose yourself in Jesus' name. Now, how do these come out? They come out by coughing, by breathing, uh, however, by crying, by weeping. Just, just take a breath and be, begin to let these things come out of you. Amen. Take a big, deep breath. Let it come out. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of rejection, we just take authority over it right now in Jesus' name and we call it out. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Rejection. 
In the name of Jesus. Who cut our heart around In the name of Jesus. In the, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Take authority, Jesus. Take authority over every spirit of rejection that you've been seeing coming against you from your own brethren. I take dominion over you in the name of Jesus. Spirit of rejection. Come out. Come out. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Spirit of rejection. I loose it from your dominion. Come out. Spirit of rejection. In the name of Jesus. Come out. Every witchcraft spirit that is worried against you. We take authority over you. In the name of Jesus. Come out. In Jesus' name. Come out. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Come on out of here. Come out. 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 I break your assignment over these people. In the name of Come out. Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus. You lose Listen. your hold Listen. Come on out. my sister. Come out. Come you have no place. We break your curses. Come out in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. I break your assignment. Come out. Loose God's people. Set them free. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. In the name of Jesus. 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 Spirit. Spirit of rebellion. In the name of Jesus. 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 Every spirit of rejection. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of rejection. Yes. Yes. In Jesus' name. Rejection from the mother's womb. We take authority we break your over assignment that. over God's In the name people. Of Jesus. You have to set us Let free. Let Let Jesus go. Christ is Lord. Come out. Come out in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on out. Just let it come go. On. In Jesus name. Come on. We break your assignment. Lucis. Lucis, come out in the name of Jesus. Come out. We break your assignment of the satanic powers. We break the assignment of rejection. Rejection in the womb. In the name of Jesus. Rejection by mother and father. Rejection by family. Rejection by husband or wife. We spread Amen. the spirit of rejection. Amen. We lose it from it in Jesus' in name. name Jesus. Spirits of rejection Hallelujah. out of family. We break the assignment of it over us. Come out. In the Come name out of in the Jesus. name of Jesus. Spirits of in rejection. Name of Come on out. Break the assignment of in it. The in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I come against the spirit of rejection. In the word against my brother in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Everything that has bound you and driven you, we release you from that right now in Jesus' name. Yes, in the name of Jesus. 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 Let that go. Hallelujah. Let that go in the name of Jesus. Spirits of uncleanness in Jesus' name, we Thank let you go of it. In the Thank name you, of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come out. Let it go. Come on, I bind you dead judgment. I break your assignment over God's people. Loose them. Loose them. Come out in Jesus' name. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on, come on. Amen. Break your assignment. <coughs> you begin to say, I renounce the demon of rejection. I take authority over you. And I cast you out and away from me. In the name of Jesus. I take authority over the spirit of rebellion. I cast you out and away from me. I take authority over the spirit of resentment. I bind you. I cast you off and away from me. In the name of Jesus. All right, you begin to get rid of it right now. In the name of Jesus, come out in Jesus' name. Come out. Yes. Yes, come out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, God is doing some things here. You just keep on, just really keep on believing God for you. I need your help. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, every spirit of rejection that has come against these precious sisters in their ministry, in the name of Jesus, I release them from it right now. In Jesus' name, the rejection of your people. In the name of Jesus, I come against that spirit that has uh, had itself on your back right now. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. 
the rejection of your people. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the rejection from your people. We release you from that right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Demons of inferiority, we come against those right now in Jesus' name. People that have been rejected feel re- uh, inferior. We come against those spirits right now. I feel that especially right around here. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over demons of inferiority in Jesus' name. And we cast you out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, just let it go. Demons of inferiority in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, yes. Amen. Come out of my sister in Jesus' name. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Fear of man and all of this that is warred against you, I release you from that right now in Jesus' name. The spirit of fear, I bind in the and break your assignment Jesus. over these people. In the name of Jesus. Spirit of fear, come out. In the name come of out. Jesus. Fear, I bind and break your assignment. Come in the name of Jesus. Fear, I break your assignment over God's people. Come out in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Spirit of fear, come out. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come out. In the name of Jesus. Break your assignment in Jesus' name. Come out. Come out. Fear, I bind and break your assignment. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. I lose this permanent. In the name of Jesus. I take authority I over the spirit of rejection. In the name of Jesus. And uh, the fear on, in on, Jesus' name. Fear, and I release them. I seek release uh, to their uh, spirit the right fear, now. Fear in the name of fear, Jesus. Fear, Every fear, hurt we thank you for the covering of the blood and that you've forgiven. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who rabba ba karanda la ba karanda? Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Oh, rabba karanda la ba karanda. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, just believe God. God's doing things right now. Just believe the Lord. Hallelujah. Let Him work on you. In the name of Jesus. Demons of rejection, rage, unforgiveness. Unbelief. We call you out in Jesus' name. Oh, Rabba Bakaranda Laba Karanda. Rabba Korianda Laba Kusharanda. Yes, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Who Rabba Karaba La Karanda Laba Koranda. Hallelujah. Come out in the name of Jesus. I, I, come on, Lucius, Lucius in Jesus' name. Break the assignment in the name of, of it. Jesus. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of rejection. Rejection against them in ministry. I take authority over that. Right now, rejection of other ministries yes. towards yes, them. Amen. In amen. Jesus' name, I take authority. Oh, we Thank cast that out Thank and away from them right now in Thank Jesus' you. name. Praise Rejection of others in ministry. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. 
Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing right now. Hallelujah. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Just pour in the oil and the wine right now. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for healing. Oh, we thank you for healing. Thank you for deliverance, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Pour in your oil and your wine. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise you. Praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you. Jesus name. Thank you, Lord. Every occult influence that is warred against my sister. I thank you, Lord, for a release. I thank you for deliverance. In Jesus name. Every psychic pressure that has come against her through others. Others that have put spells on her in Jesus name. I just call it out off of her right now in Jesus name. All psychic spells. In Jesus' name. She's accepted in the balloon. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, Rejection by children. We come against that one right now in Jesus' name. Those of you that have been rejected by children, let go of that in the name of Jesus. We call that off you, out of you in Jesus' name. Rejected by children in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Just receive deliverance this moment. Let it go. Let all the hurt go in Jesus' name. <coughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Just believing with you. God, we thank you that you're setting the captive free. We thank you that the deliverance flows in Zion for my brother and sister right now. In the name of Jesus. Rejection by tears. I take authority over that right now. And I cast it off and away from my brother. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Every bit of inferiority off my sister. Right now in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes right as snow. Just help me sing. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. To Rebaba Rabba Dere Hele Mahaya. Himaha Ramama Shanda. 
Rebba Katere Erimolo Korando. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You're the victorious one in him. Every demonic stronghold, we come against it and break your power right now in Jesus' name. All impurity, all uncleanness, all rejection, all rejection in Jesus' name. All self-abuse in Jesus' name. We call you out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for a restoration. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. Just keep believing for those that are being ministered to. Believe for yourself as well. See my sight, and now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. Then, there by faith, I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.